And today I'll be your moderator and uh, have the privilege of being in conversation with two anti-monopoly champions here. Uh, Solana Rice, who is the co-founder of Liberation in a Generation, a national movement to build power for people of color to transform the economy into a liberation economy within one generation. Uh, she's also the co-author of the Anti-Monopoly Activism Guide, Reclaiming Power Through Racial Justice, which we're really excited to engage with today. Um, our other panelist is New York State Senator Michael Giannaris, who is the Deputy Majority Leader and author of the 21st Century Antitrust Act, which is the first major piece of antitrust legislation uh, to make it through a state house, a single body of state house in decades. Uh, so we are very excited to have uh, both of them here. I'm just going to give a brief uh, well, the description of anti-monopoly because when people hear about it, a lot of times they think of you know, abstract, far off experts in rooms and courtrooms deciding, you know, what does a company really own and not own and this and that. But at its core, it's a very deeply personal idea. It's a very deeply visceral idea, which is that in more and more of American life, a small number of corporations have the power to make the rules and dominate uh, large sections of uh, the public. Um, for workers, what that means is that uh, they get to keep our wages lower. Uh, the Treasury concluded that wages are about 20% lower than they would be for the average worker uh, if uh, concentration wasn't as bad as it was. Uh, for consumers, that means that inflation is accelerated by about 25%, according to a Federal Reserve Bank, because they have the ability to raise prices and no one can do anything about it. And for everyone else, it means that we have fewer choices. But if you run a small business and you need to buy or sell to uh, your, your key market, you might have to buy or sell to a monopolist. You might have nowhere else to go. Um, Anti-monopoly says that this power exists, that it's real, and that we have tools to do something about it. Namely, we can overhaul our antitrust laws. We can make uh, new business regulations, like saying that no employer should get to misclassify an employee as a contractor. Uh, we get to uh, use collective bargaining to empower workers and to empower small businesses to, to bargain with monopolists at even playing fields. And we also get to create public options, publicly run businesses in markets where uh, business is deeply anti-competitive. Uh, so anti-monopoly presents this coherent tool. And the question today for this panel is, how do we get it done? Uh, what should we get done? And you know, as, as we all know, that there's some bad news and some good news. Uh, the bad news is that monopolists can use their economic power to convert it to political power and to fight against anything that we want to get done. The good news is we've been here before. You know, 100 plus years ago, we had a very similar situation and monopolists could use political power then too. But a coalition of small businesses, workers, farmers came together and they demanded reform. And we can do it again. Uh, so the even better news though, is that that coalition was started at the state level and that it was the states that first passed these laws. And after the first state passed the antitrust law in 1888, it only took two more years for 13 more states to follow through as well as the federal government. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the background. And uh, now I'm gonna just throw to the, throw to the panel. I think my first overall question is, uh, in doing anti-monopoly work, what have you learned and what should this group know? Should I begin, Michael? Sure. Okay, hi. Uh, well, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. And uh, I think this is a, a fascinating issue. And we're talking about something that um, uh, is in desperate need of, of reform and being done. So we have antitrust laws uh, in this country and a lot of the states individually. Um, and nobody questions them and the need for them today. But back 100 years ago, as you pointed out, when they were first enacted, uh, a lot of people did and a lot of powerful forces did, uh, those who were most affected by them. Um, and we now have a situation 100 years into the future where the economy has changed pretty dramatically. We have a, a new era of uh, robber barons who are dominating uh, the playing field and squeezing out uh, small and medium sized businesses, hurting workers. Uh, and uh, these laws now that everyone agrees should exist in some form. Uh, need to be brought up to speed to catch up to what's happening. And so we've done that here in New York. We proposed uh, the 21st Century Antitrust Act that we passed through the Senate a couple of times now. We're trying to make progress in the Assembly as well to get it done. Um, and it would do a couple, it does a lot of things, but it would do a couple of really big important things. One is it would change the very standard by which we uh, tackle 
uh, these dominant players. So we would move from the monopoly standards that exist today that are inadequate, uh, both because the um, the tactics have changed and also because court decisions have whittled them down to uh, uh, ineffectiveness. Um, and we would move to an abuse of dominance standard that is in place in much of the rest of the world, uh, which gives regulators a stronger hand against some of these players and allows them to tackle the uh, tactics that uh, are being used that are unprecedented. So you talk about a situation where, um, say, a company runs a very popular search engine, but also has an interest in the products that pop up as results on that search engine. Obviously, um, the potential for conflict and for abuse of their dominant position uh, is there for all to see. And right now, regulators have limited ability to go after that sort of thing. And so. Um, that is one aspect of it. The other is we're really trying to apply this to protect workers and employees uh, because some of these big companies are the only game in town if you want a job. And uh, the lack of uh, power, uh, lack of leverage in the hands of uh, workers uh, to negotiate a fair compensation for their services is also obvious in that kind of situation. We see it by the day, people getting abused uh, in these warehouses, uh, not being allowed to work. There's some instances where they have ambulances on call outside the warehouse because they know that people are going to get sick while they're working. Um, these are all things that uh, we can change by empowering uh, the employees, uh, prospective employees, to uh, negotiate fairer terms for themselves. And by addressing that monopsony aspect as well, uh, the bill would provide that power. So we're trying to kind of go at this from two fronts. There's a lot of other pieces to it, but uh, those are the two of the big uh, components of, of the bill. Uh, and as you pointed out, Michael, the the big boys are coming out now. They We kind of caught them by surprise in the Senate. We passed it, um, and uh, I don't think they were geared up for battle, but now they are, and we're hearing from all the big players. Um, to the credit of many of the small and medium-sized businesses, they have stepped into the void and, and are fighting the fight, even though it puts them at risk um, for obvious reasons in dealing with, uh, with the large companies. And um, we are engaged in the fight. We need the assembly to get it done, and then we'll be on our way to changing the world. Uh, thanks for that. And thank you for your leadership on that, on those issues. And I'm Solana Rice, co-founder, co-executive director of Liberation and the Generation, as Michael mentioned. And I, the thing that we are taking away at Liberation and the Generation is that corporate power is an economic and racial justice issue that at the core of all of the big words, monopoly and monopoly and markets and competition are people. And as much as uh, almost any issue in our economy, when we have inequities, black communities, Latina communities, Asian Pacific Islander, indigenous Arab communities are on the front lines of those inequities. And it's so important that we remember that these are, that, that sometimes the abstract things, as you mentioned, Michael, are real things that happen in folks' lives. Um, as the Senator mentioned, they constrain our ability to have income and go to the jobs that we want to. They constrain our health at our workplaces. It constrains our ability to be entrepreneurs. And so um, at the work of the work of liberation and a generation is in part to uh, talk about those real inequities and connect the fights that folks are having, especially that workers are having uh, against corporate power to these structural issues of anti-monopoly, monopsony, antitrust, and in a way that um, makes those terms more relevant and accessible, while also acknowledging that often the organizers are the ones that are actually building power <laughs> to continue these fights over and over. Um, and they are the ones also that can support the policies and the legislations and the legislation that leaders like uh, Senator Giannis are doing. Um, so 
that's something that we learned. Economic justice and racial justice is uh, a key part of the anti-monopoly, antitrust fights, uh, and that organizers uh, can be at the center of that conversation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks both of you. Um, in this area, what do winning coalitions look like? Uh, and how can we build them? And how are we building them? Well, the, the forces on the other side are pretty big and powerful. That's the entire point. What we're trying to do is, uh, is dilute their power, not only over markets, but over politics and over uh, public policy. Um, and so you really need all hands on deck. And what we've seen uh, here in New York, which has been affected, is a coalition of small businesses, uh, labor organizations are playing a huge role, and grassroots advocacy groups are all coming together. Uh, and sometimes when you see uh, groups that often aren't on the same page, um, that gets people's attention. We're so used to being in our typical frames, business on one side, labor on the other, or what have you. But in this case, when you see small businesses, medium-sized businesses, even very well-known businesses, like we had um, a public hearing in, uh, in the state Senate on this issue uh, last year, and one of the more compelling uh, uh, witnesses was, uh, was Yelp, uh, because they are big advocates of, of, this, uh, uh, of this legislative approach. And it's one of those things where you, know, you may like a particular business, you may not, but to see them on the other side of uh, of the big players and, and big tech uh, caught a lot of people's attention. We need to kind of grab people by, by the shirt collars and, and make that point. That helps do that. So when you see labor and business, at least some elements of business come together, uh, that's the kind of coalition I think ultimately that, that gets us over the finish line. And I would just add that I think that there are a number of ways that we can think differently about who our allies are. And what we're seeing, at least nationally, is that it's also important to lay out, at least for, we think, for the organizers especially, to lay out the importance of centering people of color and the folks that are directly impacted, right? And that our goal, our North Star, whomever is at the table, our goal and North Star is to make this a more equitable, fair economy um, for people of color. And what we're seeing is that sometimes there are concessions made in the politics um, that lose that North Star and that we've, we can make incremental changes um, and they are good changes they could be good changes. Um, but if they're not actually serving black and brown folks, or if we have allied with folks that are also um, pushing for uh, legislation or pol policies that actually exclude others, um, we might be advancing one issue to the detriment of inclusion in another area. So I don't say, I say all that not to say like we shouldn't uh, partner with unlikely allies, but we should be very clear about the values that are driving the coalition and the allyship um, and uh, what we might be sacrificing on the other side to make advances. Yeah, and I, I think that's a very good point. And it's ultimately up to those of us who put the words on the paper and the, and the bill to keep that North Star, right? So, um, what I was trying to suggest is we certainly need help to break through and, and get this done. Because I, I got to tell you, the amount of opposition uh, is significant. And if we um, if we just stay in our typical corners with the allies we typically have, we're just not going to get there. I mean, that's what we're experiencing here in New York. So the, I think you're absolutely right, Swana. We need to maintain the core of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but we need help to get there, uh, ultimately. And, and that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Yeah. And I would hope that, you know, all the all the worker wins that are happening in New York, for example, are actually hopefully like um, that somebody's making and connecting those dots between the work that you're doing and advancing and those worker wins. Like those are direct ways to shore up what you're proposing is also a direct way to 
uh, shore up and reinforce the wins that workers are having in their workplaces. And, and I don't think we've given enough credit in this conversation because we haven't brought it up yet to the, the groups that uh, represent those workers that have been engaged in this fight here in Europe. We have a group called Align New York. They have put together a coalition that um, is making those links, uh, is looking at the worker victories we've had um, through the strength and courage of a lot of these uh, workers throughout the state and, and trying to make the connection to what is uh, in some respects, a very academic issue of antitrust and what does it mean and, and how do you tackle it and really drawing uh, a connection and lets people understand what effect it has on their real lives. Yeah, should we be looking at organizations like Align or, or things like it and thinking about how other states can, you know, get something like that going or does the model look different in different places or, yeah. I don't know, Solana, do you want to you wanna go first on that? <laughs> I can give you my thoughts on it. I feel like no matter the place, engaging the people who are, are building power that can reinforce, this is almost like a reinforcing loop, right? That the Senator is talking about. Like um, the, the folks that are building power need to also help advance the policies and the policies also need to be attuned to what the organizers and the folks that are building power are seeing on the ground, right? So it's a, it's, ideally uh, a coalition that works in, in concert like that. And I don't, I think that's wherever we are in, in the US. Um, uh, fortunately, while the, the policies and the state policies might be different, the monopolists tend to look pretty similar, actually, <laughs> and use very similar uh, tactics and language and strategies. So, um, that's one advantage, I guess, of, of uh, creating uh, a, a fight against this. But I do think fundamentally having those coalitions that, that have that virtuous cycle um, is important no matter where you're working. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. And we're ultimately talking about a battle that is the people against the powerful corporations. So if you don't have someone or many someones organizing the people, uh, you're going to get rolled over. Uh, and so we have a great network of organizations like that here in New York, and uh, they have been invaluable in getting us this far. And uh, I would I would definitely suggest that other states looking to to go down this road um, engage engage the the regular folks. Yeah. Could we talk a little more concretely about what state anti-monopoly reform means for worker for workers? Um, and about this, we talk, you brought up like engaging with labor groups, engaging with the ongoing moment we're having right now around uh, uh, organize, organizing and labor in this country. So I think it'd be great to talk a little more about like, what, what does anti-monopoly deliver for workers? And, you know, how do we engage, you know? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and we should also mention part of that coalition here uh, is the Teamsters who are very uh, engaged on behalf of, of working people, as well as a host of others. Um, that are, that are that are in the fight, um, and, and so what does it mean? Well, what we're doing here in New York is we're proposing uh, what, what I referenced the, at the outset, which is a, a, a protection against monopsony, which is a dominance over um, the employee or employee relationship. Um, and when you have a circumstance when an employee or prospective employee doesn't have any cards to play in um, in negotiating for themselves, then they're going to get abused and that's happening it's happening uh, every day across america um, and so what we're trying to do is create a cause of action uh, for regulators or even for individuals who've been harmed to um, to take action when an employer is abusing their dominant position to the detriment of employees and so what it would mean it would mean a whole new uh, area of jurisprudence um, where typically now you have regulators even with our weak monopoly laws you have regulators trying to go in and, uh, and take action against the big companies for um, uh, being in a, in a monopolistic position in the market, you would now have the opportunity for employees or regulators on behalf of employees uh, to step in and, and, and try and beat back that kind of uh, 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 power that ends up uh, leading to abuse of the workforce. I will double click on everything the center says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I guess, you know, we, t we think a lot at LibGen, we think a lot about at the national, we think a lot about national policy, right? And so, um, you know, I just think it's so important 
that we keep talking about these state wins, though, because it it paves a path for federal work, as um, Michael, you mentioned at the beginning. But it's not automatic. It's not like, oh, we've got 20 states and now we just do the thing. Like, I, I think there has to be some mechanism and maybe it's um, you all at, at Democracy Policy Network that are like talking about how these wins add up and what we're learning across states and what it means for federal um, regulation and, and policy and coalition building. I don't I don't know, Senator, if you're seeing like, are you getting excited about the potential of, of uh, weighing in federally or seeing oh, I, well, we're still out. That, that's the ultimate solution, right? That um, would obviate the need for us to do anything locally in, in 50 different states. But uh, it's the history of this country that states take the boldest and, and first actions that then lead to, uh, you know, we're supposed to be the laboratories for the whole nation. And so uh, especially states that have a big disproportionate impact on the economy, New York, California, uh, and so on, um, when uh, our states, not to the detriment of any of the smaller states, there's a, there's a place for everyone here, but when our states take an action, it almost becomes a national action because uh, the market can't function without, you know, if New York or California or Illinois, Texas, you know, pick a state that has that big an impact, uh, if they take a regulatory position, it's going to affect the whole market because you can't separate your behavior as a company in, in, in places where the impact is so large. You see it most notably with California emission standards, right? The California emission standards become de facto the national emission standards. Um, in this case, we have the opportunity to do that uh, in an antitrust level. Great. <clears throat> so in, uh, in your March 21 anti-monopoly activism uh, guide, you very presciently wrote that skyrocketing prices for life-saving medicines, increasing costs of food, utility bills, and more uh, due to scant competition create, uh, created by corporate monopoly uh, make consumers pay exorbitantly high prices for poor quality products and services. Uh, in short, monopoly power constrains our freedom of choice. Uh, choice is often used as a straw man to protect you know, the powerful. Uh, but how can we think about choice in anti-monopoly? And more directly, how can we channel consumers' anger with rising prices uh, and the harms that that causes into concrete political action. Uh. Yeah, well, you know, we don't do anything without talking about organizers, right? And organizers are the ones that are having the conversations in living rooms, on doors, every day, day in and day out about this topic, right? And so um, it's absolutely critical that the organizers are funded in a long-term way to continue those conversations because while consumers may feel the pressure on their wallets, they may even make the connection to uh, the fact that corporations are deciding the prices, that they're basically doing price gouging. They might actually make, they, folks are probably making that connection. They might not then be able to say like, but what, what am I going to do about it besides going to vote? And I think we have to have more we have to have more outlets. And I think this is, again, where organizers come in. We have to have more responses than, well, you got to go vote. Because I think there are also policies that are, no matter who is in office, that we have to keep our eye on. Uh, we have to keep our eye on who is in office, of course. And in the short term, we have to be able to build coalitions that actually have power uh, to influence those who are in office right now. Um, you know, I think that it's just, it's so important to understand that folks are experiencing this day in and day out. Um, but we, it's, it's incumbent upon us as advocates and organizers to uncover the, the layers of systems and decisions that are being made that impact their their every day. Um, so yes, voting is just one aspect as folks in the in the chat are are saying. And I think I think what's so interesting right now is that folks feel really disempowered. And I think that's why we in the report we don't actually talk we have a section that talks about consumers. 
But I think it's time to stop talking about people as consumers. <laughs> like we contribute, so every one of us contributes so much more than just what we can buy, right? We are producers, we are workers, we are teachers, we are caregivers. The, all the aspects, we are entrepreneurs, like all of these aspects of us are impacted by corporate power and by corporate capture. And so I, I also think that is another way to connect the the fights that organizers are having on everyday issues um, to corporate power. Because no matter what we're talking about, whether we're talking about policing and communities and, and black and brown communities, whether we're talking about surveillance, whether we're talking about creating uh, job opportunities, whether we're talking about housing, you can trace a line back to corporate power and unchecked, <laughs> unchecked corporate power, right? And democracy, just our ability to even go vote, vote is, is um, impacted by that. So I, I think it's incumbent upon us to um, think about folks as whole folks that contribute to the economy in a multitude of ways besides as consumers and trace that line back to uh, corporate power. And then actually talk about the ways that folks can contribute locally as leaders um, through our democratic processes, right? It's not the only, and I think that the work that the senator is doing and the um, state policy is a great demonstration that we have many levels of democracy for people to participate in. And we don't have to wait until um, uh, the feds, the feds decide to do something or not to do something. We actually have um, practices. And I think what's so interesting about what's happening right now is that it's also a gateway into different practices of democracy. So we talk about unions, for example, that is a practice in democracy. That is a a practice in governance, um, which I think is so uh, critical to think about, like, what is the next phase? If we had some wins and somebody mentioned, like, what is our regulatory infrastructure? Well, who is deciding in those regulations, right? Who really has power in decision making in our regulations? Um, and if we're saying that we're centering the people most impacted, we have to prepare people that are the most impacted to actually be making decisions and doing governance. And I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I, I'll say this to someone who's in my line of work, beware of the politician who tells you the answer to your problems is vote for them. Uh, because we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing right now play out in real time. And like, I think the Democratic Party is obviously better suited to represent working people and those uh, struggling to make it than the Republican Party, for God's sakes, for sure. Uh, but there are plenty of people within my own party who are part of the problem. Um, and you watch it playing out uh, every day on the news, whether it's trying to get a climate uh, proposal done or uh, tackling Roe v. Wade. Every Democrat will tell you, go out and vote in November. And you certainly should. <laughs> you should vote for Democrats. But that is not it if they're not doing what they need to do to address the problems. And uh, what I've found is, yes, certain parties are more inclined one way than another. Uh, but really, the battle is less Democrat versus Republican than those who have power and those who do not. And there are plenty of people uh, within my own party who are sitting there shilling for the powerful um, and so we got to constantly keep their feet to the fight yes vote for people and then hold them accountable uh, after your vote is cast uh, and that requires organizing and staying on top of it and not losing sight of the struggle well yeah i think we're coming up on the hour but that it's i think it's a great place to leave us off um thank you both for your perspectives for attending i saw in the chat someone said well if i have an anti-monopoly problem my boss is a corporation what do i do how do i get involved um i can only speak for our organization but like if anyone's interested in doing state level anti-monopoly you know organizing we would love to talk to you um I, i'm sure this would and you know support uh, the senator's bill uh, you know, a call if you're in New York area, call uh, your representative or wherever you are, call your representative. If you are your representative, think about the ways that you can uh, introduce anti monopoly legislation and in, in in get involved in the work, is what we'd have to say. Um, and if you'd like a shameless plug, uh, feel free to read our uh, anti monopoly policy guide if you're interested in the specifics of what you can get done. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, uh, Solana, Senator Ginares. It's been a pleasure.